it's always been like that. And I think we've allowed ourselves at times to be impressed by little models that have broken the mold. You know, the advert told you the thing was cutting through the wind and it felt like it was cutting through the wind. And I've never been so excited getting into a new car. But th that V8 manual is just was just such a brilliant car. the Collecting Addicts podcast. I'm reliably informed this is episode number 36. I'm in Italy where I have just failed to finish the modern Accenza Ore and have drunk five lagers, so I might be a bit gobby. Chris Cooper's in the UK, as is Manish Pandey, as is Neil Clifford. Edward Lovett is in Australia. It's 5am and his forehead was shiny, but at our request has covered it with a hat. Now, the agenda for today is important. You've been drinking grappa as well. I've not been on the grapple. I'm going to do that immediately after this podcast. So, <laughs> to business, Audi. Is it the brand of the Upwardly Mobile or is it the brand of the See You Next Tuesday? Neil Clifford, please discuss. Well, I just don't get Audi anymore. <laughs> right? I've been thinking long and hard on this because I'm on a lovely little WhatsApp group with some amazingly stylish Scottish racing car drivers and Audi is one of the biggest subjects because a lot of more successful Scottish men than me have houses where they go and ski which I actually don't like skiing at all but when they go and ski they love to buy Audis yep. and all these SQ7s and SQ9s and RS6 Performantes or whatever they're called and I, I need automotive Viagra. I can literally not get excited about the brand Audi anymore, ever. And I'd like to discuss why, because why is that? I've got lots of opinions on that. You know, I think they're, it's like going to the John Lewis kettle department or look at <laughs> Morphe, oh, Richard, Morphe Richards ironing boards. It's yeah, I'll give so you that one. fucking boring. You're being they, very boring colours, nice boring Scottish interiors, friends. and they're driven by boring people. And I just don't really understand the brand. And I'd like to discuss that with my learned colleagues because maybe I'll learn something. It didn't used to be like that, though, did it? No, it didn't. No. Ah, like you know what? Strong... I disagree with you. I think I think it did used to be like that. I think it's always been like that. And I think we've allowed ourselves at times to be impressed by little models that have broken the mould. But fundamentally, we scrutinise Audi over the last 30 years. Is there a single model that you really go, wah, over? Not just, oh, I quite respect it, and oh, I'd like to drive it to Chamonix for the weekend. But is there a model that makes you go, bloody hell, driving that changed my life? No. I had an oh, RS6 right. V10 thing, and it was shit. The steering was crap. It was wooden. It felt like there were 50 boxes of bricks in the back. The dash was horrible. The fonts was horrible. It was The interior was chavy and plasticky. Everything was wrong with it. I sold it immediately, not on collectingcars.com. Wasn't around. <laughs> right. One of us, okay, I've got to be sensible here, people, because we can't just assassinate brands without having a voice of defence. One yeah. of us owns an Audi. Manish, please tell us about why... <laughs> Manish, you have one minute now beginning on the subject of Audi. <laughs> Hesitation, <laughs> deviation or repetition are not allowed. Am I allowed to laugh? <laughs> just... So look, last week's episode, remember I was telling you, I'm looking to replace my 16-year-old uh, beast. And I did sit in an A6, a pretty well-spec one, as I said last week. It was the most meh experience of my yeah. life. But I will say... In, I remember, do you remember the very beautiful Audi 100 that came out? It was about 35 years ago, and it was the one that they advertised with the coefficient of drag it's of cute. exactly 0.30. Yeah. And um, a friend, a friend's mother bought one in Switzerland. I remember to, I, he, he picked me up at the airport, and I'd never seen anything so beautiful. I mean, they took the basic hat shaped car and sculpted it in a way that mm. I, you know, mm. it was, and the interior felt very special. and you know, the advert told you the thing was cutting through the wind and it felt like it was cutting through the wind. And I've never been so excited getting into a new car. But I think 
beyond that, I'd say you're absolutely right. I mean, the reason why I bought an A4 was I, I was looking for an estate that was just not too big. And I found this A4 Avant and I ordered the thing online. And as I said, it had a fridge in it. You know, that was the one thing I specified. You could buy it and, you know, all the other bits and pieces. But no, I, it's really difficult. You mean to somebody argue. had left a fridge in the boot. Is that what you mean? No, no, it's, an, it's, it's brilliant. It's a glove compartment. So you open the glove compartment. There's a small, because our son was one and I figured cold milk on long journeys. And my wife said, oh, no, 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 you don't want to get that. It's a ridiculous, and we use it every single journey. It's a great little fridge. The Keeps your milk. chocolates and your water very, very cold. But yeah. I think Neil's spot on. It's just the most underwhelming car company, full stop. It's just underwhelming. There's nothing- It is now. I, it, yeah. It's not about Sport Quattro. Really? Oh, no, 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 okay, yeah, yeah. And Michelle Mouton's Audi Quattro. That's mm. the other kind of exception. You know, in the 80s, when she was carving up Africa, driving that car, that was a bloody sexy car. But that's Diesel Gate. Dieselgate, Dieselgate, Dieselgate didn't help. Right. Didn't Diesel Audi R8 V10 manual. But the right. R- well, the, I want to hear but, what Chris but, I want to hear what Chris Cooper's about to say about Dieselgate. So Dieselgate didn't help. I mean, even though D- you could argue that Dieselgate wasn't just an Audi phenomenon, it was sort of it sort of spoke of a mentality and an attitude that was cynical. And I think when you have that kind of cynicism and dishonesty, it's very hard if you end up with a product, whether it's legally defined and it's fuel consumption or it's it's messiness or pollutingness. You just end up with and they were they, so diesel gate. The evidence suggested that the first cars that were cheating arrived in the late noughties. So they must have been thinking about it from the mid noughties, at the very least. Even if they didn't do it, they must have been thinking about it. If so any lawyer listens to this, Chris is alleging that they might have been doing this from the late noughties. I'm, I'm speculating. Yes. Yes, I'm speculating. Um, but it just speaks of a cynicism and dishonesty, which makes you think, how good's the car going to be? Was just going to be, and now you roll that forward, where they clearly got found out, and a lot of people, some quite capable people, their slight dishonesty and criminality aside, went to jail. And you look at, I mean, we talked about this over the weekend. It's just lots of Q tanks, a small mm. Q tank mm. or a big Q tank. They're all just tanks. And the, I do think, I know when the Quattro first appeared, that, Anybody who was a little boy like I was who went to the motor show in Birmingham in 1980, motor show, motor fair, 1980, when the Quattro was there. And that those adverts, remember Jeffrey Palmer, the actor who oh, did yeah. the sort of the yeah, voiceovers? Yeah. Vorsprung, der Technik, as they like to say in Germany. You think, that's just brilliant. I mean, okay, substance might not be as exciting. We tried one now, we think it's not all that. But for a while there was, and the RS6, for a while, did have that marketplace for not the one that you had, the C, the C seven, the one I had one in two thousand sixteen. It's a big cylinder. It was C7, that was the, that was the V eight one. It was a little slower than mine, I think. Yeah, it was. Yeah, I'd one it of those. O- but it was just okay. It was just okay. It wasn't that special. So good seats. I, so yeah, I think it's just got to the point where. They stop caring. They just okay. stop caring. I, 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 I've got some stri- stri- quite strong feelings about Audi. First of all, before we go there, Jeffrey Palmer, in the episode in which he cameoed in Forty Towers, Waldorf salad, you'll remember. Ooh. What was the oh. food? What was the food that he absolutely demanded but couldn't get? Um, didn't he want a screwdriver? Sausages. He wanted to cook sausages. Sausage. In, sausages. That's right. He was in the kitchen, wasn't he? In the kitchen. I just want some bloody sausages. Right. Yes. Okay. So the Audi thing is unfortunately one of the great confidence tricks, industrial confidence tricks of our time. Ooh. Audi was nothing more than a rebadged Volkswagen in uh, in Germany for many years. My mother had an Audi 80 estate in the mid to late seventies. It was a Passat. It was a Passat with a different badge on it. So it was, it was really, it was a nothing, it was a badge exercise. And then the and then Piech forced the Quattro through, which which changed motorsport. And the car itself was technologically very interesting. You know, it was a bit flawed, it had an inline, a longitudinal five-cylinder engine to one side, 
with like the battery on the other side. It was all weird under the bonnet, but it had four wheel drive and it and it built a brand. In fact, it did more for the brand in two and a half years of rallying or three years of rallying than all of its prototype bollocks did in 10 years. I won't deny that. But the cars were always fashion over form. They never ever were based on what you'd call cutting edge engineering. Audi never wanted to go out and beat Mercedes and BMW by making mm. better cars than them. They wanted to have better dealerships, better looking cars. Remember Audi for years boasted about anti-corrosion. That was the, the reason for buying yeah. a B5, A4, or the car before it, the one with no boot, was that it didn't corrode. What a way to sell something. Not you'll love owning this or you'll feel good, but it won't rust. Oh, great. Anyhow, and that Audi 100 that Manish talks about was an incredible motor vehicle because it looked like a spaceship from Weird. the outside, but it had a beam rear suspension. If you look at them from the rear, they just got a torsion beam at the back. Yeah. They had the rear Massive suspension. overhangs, front and rear. Just so, and Audi have always been like this. And about 20 something years ago, in the back of Autocar magazine, I wrote a column called Why I Hate the Audi TT. <laughs> and Audi never really spoke to me properly after that. And I, I sort of regret it. It was childish. I just said that ultimately it's a golf that looks like it's been sat on by a hippo. Was that, was that the article where I had to tell you how to spell the word competences? It might well have been, Chris. But or you, was that you another had, Audi article? No, you we had, had this conversation about Audi for about 20 years. Yeah. You had to correct me so many times when your hair was brown. And I think it, you know, it really, I can't, I can't help my spelling, but I think Audi has always been, you know, jazz hat over function. And I'll tell you why, and I've got an anecdote or a series of non-anecdotes that will explain this. Over the years, I've got to know lots of automotive engineers, ones I really respect, and they tend to come from German companies because they're the ones that lead this. I've heard Mercedes engineers lust after and talk about Porsches, I've heard them talk about BMWs. I've felt mutual respect amongst mm. those brands. Mm. I've I've had a man from BMW almost have a wet dream when the IS200 Lexus came out because he couldn't believe the money that Lexus spent on that car. I've heard nothing but derision over the years from those companies about Audi's products. I don't know what that says. I think there was a period when Audi did make some good cars. I think the B5... Uh, a4 was a clever car. It yeah. was a beautiful looking car. And I think the Quattros with the independent suspension at the rear were quite clever. And I think the C7 RS6, you know, you can't argue against it being an amazing achievement. It's just so competent. But how many cars have they made that make you lust after them? I just, uh, I don't think Audi... The, dash, the dashboards are horrible. And they smell funny. Audi they smell, smell funny. They do yours, smell, yours funny. smell funny. Yeah, yours always they smell just, funny. Just, But I think it, for me... Be you know, be careful. The be careful how you sow your cynicism because Audi made a very famous advert in 1995 for the B the B5 A4, the black and white sepia one that becomes color with the stockbroker who gets in the car for the test drive. Oh yes, he's given the keys. I've written it. I watched it earlier. He gets in. He goes a London boy, city boy, and he goes money, nothing to be ashamed of, and he talks about his wealth. He gets out of the test drive and he hands the keys back and he goes, "That's nah, not for me." And that was that was Audi saying, "We're not BMW." And then what? shouts, "Taxi!" Well, I think they've become that, haven't they? In many ways, yeah. that's that's what the brand has become. Yeah. And I think they're. You know, I, I I'd love to love Audi more, but that's a bit of a rant from me. Edward, help in, me. Out. In, in in sneaker world, if BMW is Nike, Audi is Puma. Ooh, oh, interesting, interesting. <laughs> and how many of us wear Puma? Not that many. Chris has got a couple. Chris has got several pairs of Puma. Walk Converse around three. London and try and find a pair of Pumas. They're not that popular. Edward, you always struck me as a bit of an Audi guy. What <laughs> makes you say that? Are you, are you still <laughs> drinking? <laughs> Well, first of all, I think after your rant started with uh, the Audi campaign was um, they don't rust, which answers N Neil's original rant about why his beautiful Scottish friends drive them, because it's quite damp in Scotland. And obviously, if they're taking them to the Alps, to their ski lodges, yes. um, you know, clearly need a car that doesn't rust. So they're obviously very practical, your beautiful Scottish friends, and they've decided to... Um, buy into the Audi marketing campaign to, so they have a car that doesn't rust. Um, That's true. I, I've always felt for most normal 
Audis, saloons, ex, uh, uh, Vance, etc. They're all always feel a bit dead at the steering wheel. They do. However, an Audi R8 V8 manual, the first V10. iteration. V10 is the one. Uh, yeah, well, the, but the the first, I I I, I think I, we talked about it in the podcast yeah. at some point. But I, I went and drove a Audi uh, R8 V10 manual around, uh, sorry, V8 manual around Europe. And it was such a well sorted car, and you could use all the RPM. It was just yep. such a wonderful thing. It's a, it's and a, I, a, a year later, I did the same trip in a V10. And you're right, you know that was it was a bit more Lamborghini. That you know the engine, the noise, it was brilliant. But th that V8 manual is just was just such a brilliant car. So, so I've, got, I, I've, I've never driven one. one. The thing about these a brand like Audi that I think has had, you know, has made a, an amazing reputation out of a lot of averageness for me is there there are greatest hits, you know, a B7 RS4 a van, a, you know, it's a great car when you see it on the road. I had a B8 S4 quirky thing, but we tuned it up to four and something horsepower. What a great car! Lots of great cars, but but they have the ability to engineer no soul into their vehicles. Really, I think, and, and I'm and I'm unapologetic about that. Um, have we finished the Neil's obviously, Neil, Neil's, no, Neil, Neil's obviously had a bad week with Audi because a few weeks ago, one of the topics that he wanted to talk about was hmm. can you own an Audi TT? And I don't no, think we ever. I said, could you oh, live with a TT? For, could you live with a TT for a year? Yeah. Which would be the shortest question ever posed. Yeah. Uh, my, my, cat, my catalyst for this is when I drove out of Bista Scramble on Sunday, late for my daughter's birthday. I followed a Quattro and I thought, actually, it's just a fabulous looking thing uh, on a B reg, I think. So probably not a 20 valve, just a lovely little, lovely looking thing. And I thought that's probably the last Audi that I've lusted after. Cause actually I've had two RS twos. I didn't really like them. Yeah. It's just not quite there. No, you I mean, know, I know the the auto car says it's faster than McLaren, not to 60. And we all bought into that and we love the Nagaro blue and we love the Porsche brakes and we love all that sort of, but actually it was a, didn't, it, I didn't enjoy it at all. Do you remember that headline, we, um, by the way, that, that was a shameful headline. It wasn't not to 60. It was not to 30. <laughs> Yeah. It was quicker than a McLaren, not to 30. <laughs> we, yeah. we obviously uh, lost, um, Ken Block far too early, but he he had they just Audi had just built that amazing electric car for him, so yeah. it would have been interesting to see what could have happened with that brand direction from both design but also you know radical electric sports cars. Yeah, I think it's a broader subject when we come on to automotive Viagra to use my slightly dodgy analogy. How do we get excited about electric cars? I think that's going to be a conversation for the future because it's more difficult. Yeah, we're talking about that another way. day. That's I think. not how you framed this discussion. In fact, whilst one of you talks, I'm going to repeat the way you framed the Audi thing <laughs> to us on our group. Yes. Neil. It's one of the great phrases. Where was it? Here we go. We need an Audi rant. They are the dildo of the Luxury <laughs> Express. <laughs> now, I've lived that a shelter was life. Exactly I, I know no what word. a Luxury yeah. Express is, but what is a dildo? I suppose it's when surely the real version quite of the a real dildo thing. is more exciting than a dildo, isn't it? <laughs> One would hope. So it's a substitute thingy. Yeah, <laughs> not quite the real thing. Okay, exactly. not, quite the real not, thing. not quite. I think you're quite right. Maybe it's, that's it's, the thing. Even if you're in an RS6 and you're driving along, if you see a, if you see something in an M5, you go, "Fuck it, he got it right." Yes, <laughs> you do. Yeah, you do. Right. Okay. Before we get sued, I'm going to move on to the next <clears throat> thorny issue for today's thorny night of discussions. Um, high depreciation cars. And the value one sees within them, and also I add on to that, how hard it is to explain to friends and family how that value should work, because normally it's seen through the goggles of man maths. We're going to have to go straight back to Mr. Clifford again here, because he might be the finest exponent of this particular brand of bullshit I've ever met in my life.
Go well, on. this 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 subject was given to me by my friend Paul, who is equally as mad as me about automotive conversations, and we were discussing the Bentley Continental GT. Which one? Sp um, the Which Super one? Sport. The current uh, one. The previous 10 one. 11. Yep. Okay. Not, not the current one. It's not as pretty, the current one. The, the, the original one, but the Super Sport, where they updated it a bit, and then the bigger engine and all of that. And, and Paul owns one of these cars. And for 50 grand, when the car was 190 grand new and it's 620 horsepower, the most incredible piece of engineering, carved out a solid block of titanium, um, beautiful car. In fact, the Veron seats in the car, fantastic, beautiful dashboard. And for 50 grand, which is frankly cheaper than most boring Audis, what incredible purchase! And 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 I added one more thing. It's it's we should all go and do this and don't buy these boring shit new cars anymore because actually it's much better for the environment. Let's buy Bentleys as opposed to shit new <laughs> Audis. <Well>, Bentleys. <laughs> Keep can I, all can the, I... We don't need any more cars in the world. They don't rust anymore. They don't break down anymore. Let's just can buy all the old ones. Can I can I assume my adenoidal voice and be the consumer editor of What Car for a minute and say, it's all very well, but how much do you think the rear fog light assembly for a Bentley Continental GT costs when it's out of warranty? Because I we one of the films that will never be sadly broadcast on Top Gear is we bought one of these things last year and went to uh, somewhere in Af North Africa in one, and it was freaking brilliant. It was a great car. It was the best car of three by a mile, and then mm. they presented us with some parts prices. And yes, jaws hit the floor. My hey, um, best friend. Yes, but my, yes. Sorry. Manish. My best friend. My best friend bought one uh, a few years ago, and he actually moved house because of this car. <laughs> the, reason being, <laughs> the reason being, he didn't have off-street parking, and the number of times its fucking wheels got nicked. He had all four wheels stolen off that car five times. And moved he should out. have bought locking wheel nuts. Oh, God, I think they can get around that. Honestly, these vans turned up. He had cameras. He had cameras facing forward. These guys would literally lift the car up, get the wheels off, and they were gone. Fourth that time that happened, That proves out. its desirability. Just, Doesn't it? They're not going to yeah. nick wheels off an Audi because the fucking <laughs> boy. Chris Cooper, you strike me as a kind of fourth-hand Bentley guy. Where do you sit on this one? So, um, I think there are other examples. Okay, please tell us. Um, yes. You could argue McLaren 12C. Totally. Is, I looked this afternoon, under 60 grand now for a 600-something no. horsepower Ron Dennis, more time spent on it than God spent creating the earth. Ron's still doing that presentation, telling us how clever it is. He's still at it now. 100%. 10, 12 could, years later. What could possibly go wrong with a 13-year-old <laughs> <Exactly. self> <laughs> uh, It would be fun, though, wouldn't it? It would um, be. You could so argue. It doesn't could mean work. you can tell people to do it. So it's a bit more modern, but I still think it's a lot of car for the money. 720S. Yeah. I don't know about a third of the price they were. But yeah. personally, and you and I both know this car, Monkey, the original Panamera Turbo. Oh, tank. Absolute tank. 18 grand. Brilliant. Really? 18 I mean, grand for Panamera Turbo. Yeah. The search is over. I mean, it's just... I looked this afternoon, because, you know, I've got, I've got one. Not quite that old. And I, whenever I talk to people at the dealership about it, I say, have I actually got the only one you've ever sold? <laughs> and they sort of say, Oh, no, no. I, said, oh, I definitely have. And I, I'll, I can never sell it because it'll just be so heartbreaking. But I reckon for 18 grand, you could get an original. They don't look great, but you, we used to drive them to our mutual friend, Guy Spur, had one when they first came out. To yes. go to Germany and back, and what a machine. Great, fun. It was quite good fun to drive. Best directional stability in crosswinds of any car I've ever driven. Yes, you're now, on, 60 the... on a crosswind, you're not even aware of it in the no. bloody thing. No, beautifully built, lovely inside, nice dash, some of that sort of yachting type wood inside and just, you know, 
18 so grand if anybody wants to be in that. You had the yachting spec. Yeah. Yachting wood. Um, Edward, um, now I'm not being rude here or unkind, but have you ever we suffered? Are. Oh, you're about to be. No, you? just just pipe down. Have you ever suffered depreciation on a car? <laughs> yes, or, uh, we've talked about this, haven't we? We've no, no, about no, no. That was, that was when you bought a car on behalf of a business and it shat itself. That's different. <laughs> you, <laughs> you're, you're, I'm, 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 I'm segueing into a compliment. You're a clever bugger who tends not to lose money on cars. So how do you go about? Finding cars that have depreciated. Now, so Neil's point about um, the Continental GT, which he's obviously talking about a car that's now fifteen years old. What 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 is a what was the first year of a Continental GT? Oh, oh, three, oh, four. Yeah, oh, three, fine. Four. So almost 20, 20 years old. And he was, now I, an 11, he was talking about an eleven plate, wasn't he? A later one. In fairness, Super to Sport. Neil. 10, okay. 11, yeah. well, I, I, to, to me, I now I appreciate that's still depreciation, but when I look at depreciation, I'm thinking about how a car really plummets in price from in first, quite yeah. a young age. Yeah, and so historic and and th this conversation is actually not the right, perfect time because cars just haven't been depreciating over mm. the last couple of years. Exactly that. Any, exactly that. If, if anything, they've been appreciating and. Whilst Neil talks about that cheap Bentley Continental GT, which, Chris, I'm with you. I'm sort of, what car, how much is that rear light cluster? You you, you had a loan car last year, I think. You had a um, Bentley GT Speed, didn't you? GTC yeah. Speed, something like that. And you, you said, this is just an amazing car. So... I do what I do, which is go on to Auto Trader, have a look at Bentley Continental GTs, less than a year old, price high to low. And you couldn't find one at under 200 grand. Now, I appreciate that they were probably 250 grand new, but my understanding of Bentley Continental GT, if you have a brand new car at 250 grand, about three days later, it should be about 129,950. <laughs> <laughs> and a 612 would be a good example of that. You know, when they yeah. were new, you know, a 612 was the most expensive Ferrari. You know, if you put all the toys on it, it was a hundred and I think you could a one to one was like 179 grand. But about three minutes after you took delivery, you know, if you turn back, say it's not really for me, the dealer principal would have said, mm, it's not really for us either. <laughs> and, but you you would you would have, you would have wanted to pay a hundred and 10, 120,000 pounds, and it would have been really hard to find a second owner. I but gave these... you 75 grand for one that was five years old and shat itself. So what happened, what, yeah. what happened there? But but these cars, they just haven't been depreciating, which is, it's going to be a big fucking shock to the system over the next 24 <laughs> months because I, it's coming. Um, I'm just thinking and... depreciating. Just thinking say, say about that Bentley. Ele electric cars are depreciating. A, 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 yeah. a take you know, I'm, I'm in Australia at the moment, and apparently, Taycan's pretty fucking tough down here. You know, the the infrastructure's not great, and yeah. you know they're super expensive, and they're piling up in the dealer forecourts. Um, sorry, Porsche, if uh, I wasn't meant to say that. Um, but well, that they is are now. The I, I was in a, I was, I had one, um, on two years. The company ran it, it was a lease thing we did for two years, and I thought about buying it at the end of it. And the least BW Finance just wanted too much money. Um, and it wasn't disconnected from the Porsche app on here. So I could see that for the next nine months, it was sat at the same position on the end of the runway at Bruntingthorpe no. for about nine or 10 months. And then it went to uh, a non-franchise dealer in somewhere in North London who prided himself on being North London's favourite family-owned dealer. And then the next time I saw it, it's been hilarious because it's got a map as well. I then saw it parked adjacent to a container in a freight terminal in North London. And then two days later, it turned up in Cyprus, oh. where it spent the rest of the summer while still on sale in the dealer's website. And then he must have. So I got so hilarious. There's a little button here. We can toot the horn and flash the lights. So every now <laughs> often, I would just press the toot the board button and flash the lights thinking, this guy is going to, you must be shitting us. What's wrong with my car? Eventually, I've been cut off. I must have realised, oh, shit, somebody was watching all that I'm doing. The Bentley, though, there was one on collecting cars. There was a W12 GTC earlier on this year. And it went for 
It's a 2015 car, W12, oh. beautiful spec. And I think, I'm just trying to find it. I think it went for about 52, 53,000. Yeah. That's They're lovely one. cars. Lovely a car. Lot, lot of motor for the money. A lot of motor for the money. A lot of motor for the money. Can I just, I'm, I don't normally give any advice on cars to buy. And I'm certainly not an investment uh, guru when it comes to what to buy and what not to buy. But a car that has suffered with some depreciation over the last six months, which I, I think is in the buy window now. So a 992 Turbo S when they were launched were about 150 something thousand quid. And during COVID, they kept putting the prices up. Whoosh. So a, 9, a 992 Turbo S now coupe with a couple of options on it is a 200,000 pound car. Wow. And there, there was a 12 month or 24 month waiting list. You couldn't get one. So all the dealers were asking 225 grand for those cars and you know you could run them for free effectively or well, that's what everyone thought was they ordered one because they saw all these cars at 225 grand there are a few cars still for sale for 225 grand because i think the dealers might have paid a bit too much for them and are hoping some bloke's going to walk in off the street and just buy one because he fancies one but you can get a sub one year old 992 turbo s now for about 150,000 quid, yeah. which wow. I, appreciate that's, I appreciate that's a lot of money. However, you know, this is a car that now costs 200 grand new yeah. and a well-specced Carrera 4 GTS or something along those lines it's the same. With, with all the options um, is like 145 or 150 grand. So if you're in the market for a 992, don't worry about the facelift coming out or hybrid or whatever you're going to go and do. Go and buy yourself a 2022 Turbo S. Plant yourself in that for the next two years. And I think you'll struggle to find another car on the road that will beat it. And, and I think it will probably look after you quite well from a depreciation point of view. Wise words. Time. You exactly. Real world car buying advice yeah. on the Collecting yeah. Addicts podcast. Yeah. We will help you make your sub £200,000 car buying decisions more easily. Manish, <laughs> any thoughts on this? Whilst yeah, I tell you now... Literally, that there's one car I very, very, very much lust after every time I walk past it, park around the corner, and um, I actually met the owner six months ago and asked him about it. It's a beautiful black Maserati Quattroporte. And That's it's a good one. 2017. It's the V8 GTS. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, Automatic gearbox. Yeah. I, I'm not saying that I would buy it, but it does have automatic gearbox. But it's um, he bought it for forty five thousand yeah. pounds, and I think new it was sort of one hundred and thirty or something, you know, one hundred and twenty five bucks. And it is just a limousine. It's the most beautiful thing. It sounds fantastic. I mean, it sounds really, really sexy when he starts it up. I don't think he uses it very much, but um, I imagine that is an absolute doozy, isn't it? In terms of um, you know car that you'd buy second time around. And I think the la the ones that were built, I mean, I asked him, do you have problems with it? And he hasn't. The ones that were built sort of around 2018, 2019, 2020 were actually quite well built. The late, uh, those late Maseratis with the ZF yeah. gearboxes, the GTSs. Uh, the, exactly, the he's got a V8 GTS, was, exactly. Were, were brilliant cars. And back in my dealer days, when I was walking through the workshop, um, there were these poor sods coming in with Maserati 3200s, which were worth about um, 12 to 15,000 pounds at this stage with the boomerang headlights. Yeah. And they didn't really want to come and pick them up after their service because they weren't <laughs> overly prepared to pay the 14,000 pound servicing bill to come no. and pick up their 12,000 pound 3200. Did you, did you that, ever that, try? That is, that, honest story, that. Did Imagine. you ever try one of those with the can be your Corso? Yeah. Oh. yeah. That was an art to drive one nicely. Did you the drive... art was to leave it at home. Did you drive, <laughs> did you drive the Spider? If you drove the Spider... I did. It was like, can you imagine bathing a cat and it's covered in soap and you're trying to catch it? That's what the steering column was like. You'd fucking <laughs> chase the thing around the cabin. Yeah. It was like, what the... You know, I, I, you know how I like six series convertibles. I saw that when that Maserati Spider came out, uh, I thought, you know, I might actually move on from a six series convertible to try that. I went to try it and I thought, it's one of the most disappointing test drive experiences. We're going to do test drive experiences okay. at some point. 
the, that was the, one the, of the UK press car spider was a jello fly. Remember, it had a shorter wheelbase. Yes. And there's two sort of things, uh, sort of roll, fake rollover things above it. Yeah. And you know that cut, if you're in, if you're leaving Fulham trying to get to the A4, you can do a cut through that ends up around the back of Queens Club that goes past the, the, the housing estate. Yes, there. West Kent. Uh, Ken, yeah. West Kent. And it broke. It broke down there, and it was probably two thousand or two thousand and one, whenever they made. Did you a favour near a tube station? Well, I um, I got out, and some local youths uh, they they took quite a lot of attention to the car, so I just left it with them with the key. <laughs> Best thing. Serves off. them right. I, you know, I'm going to get stabbed. It's not over that short wheel short wheel based shit box. Um, so this um, this this whole depreciation thing has got me thinking that recently I've been looking for another vehicle because I, I need something to do some miles in. And, I, and actually, what, what Neil has surfaced here is that quite often I'm more seduced by the knowledge that I might be able to get something that's cheaper than it should be than actually wanting the car. So the question is, how many cars have we bought that we didn't actually want because we thought they were just too fucking cheap to ignore? Answer yeah. My like answer for me, many. But I, I now realise, as Edward's pointed out, and all of you have agreed, depreciation isn't happening the way it used to. And I think it's a great shame because we used to get off on it. So for me, the two cars that always depreciated were any Ferrari with a V12 in the front and a BMW M5. Both cars, the moment you drove them out of the showroom, halved in value. Now, that meant that you knew the people that owned them were reassuringly wealthy and still owned them because they could afford them and they didn't mind the depreciation. And it meant there were rich prickings for little scavengers like us out there because really we're just parasitic. We want to piggyback other people's misfortune and buy these cars. But recently I've been looking around. There's so little value out there. I wanted mm. to buy one of those. I will hopefully get one of those Alpha Julia Cloverleafs. But you try, you know, there's cars that have done 50,000 miles and people want 38 grand for them. That yeah. should be 21,995 and they should be begging me to buy it, but they're not. Um, actually, if you start looking around to look for the value, there's a, you know, some of those Aston V8 Vantage, the early guppy mouth ones, they're coming down into a zone where they look like a lot of value to me. DBSs, the, the current DBS is coming down a bit. That's a great a car. Bit. But so, so that I should be, we should be, we should be laughing at those for sixty nine 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 five now, and we're just not. So I reckon we need to get a t shirt going with collecting ads that says "Bring back depreciation," because really, yes. depreciation bring back financial ruin. And, and to come back to Neil's analogy, depreciation is the KY jelly of the car enthusiast universe. It lubricates our passion. It lubricates so, our passion. Planet, don't buy no. cars because they're all. Yes. By the old and the great irony is of all the cars that i reckon are good value at the moment neil neil mentioned it it's electric cars so the one that strikes me at the moment as being huge value is the audi e-tron gt that's the rebodied taycan they yeah, clearly can't sell, they can't sell them but they look magnificent they go like a fucking stab rat and they're just and they're a great car you know if you've got a driveway and seven other cars to use when they don't work what a machine fabulous machine and of course, the, 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 electric, the, the electric car needs a uh, needs a session again from uh, on the pod. But today is not, not 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 the one. But to, to to finish that another rant, the best value car of all is a Bentley Mulsanne because we manage value against what something costs to make, and the Bentley Mulsanne takes about seven and a half years just to make the ventilation system. People have died on the line. They take so long to build. And you can buy one of those for 70 grand now. And you should, because it's a wonderful motor car. And it won't make you look like you lost your soul or anything. It's a wonderful car. Buy Bentleys, save the planet. Buy Bentley, save the planet. Right, we're moving <laughs> on to, here we go. Ah, now, car typography. Okay. So, and I mean this quite specifically. This isn't just, you know, enamel badges. I'm talking about the way car names and badges have been written over time. And I think it's one area where our industry can hold its head high. I think over time, typographically, we match any other industry, fizzy drinks, trainers, anything else that's supposed to be funky and thinks it knows how to do this stuff. Car badges, absolutely rock. I'm starting this one because I've been, I'm on this rally. I've turned up and the first car I've seen is a wide body Mark II Escort atlas axle dripping underneath it like a massive scrotum and on the back it's got rs 1800 with the zeros in my favorite fast forward than Beautiful. that is that is the most amazing piece of sign writing i've ever seen it's just stunning so i'm going to give my fellow podders an opportunity to eulogize about their favorite car writing badgesy thingsies Manager. lamborghini lamborghini countach at the back 
So you have Lamborghini with this beautiful signature. And I looked it up. It's called La Machina, the uh, font. But it's the Countach. It's just simply an italic Helvetica. But the U and the N are joined by the vertical stalk. And every time I see that, something awful happens down below. But it's wonderful, too. It's so sexy. So sexy. There's nothing you can touch. Uh, Neil Clifford will have thought about this for probably upwards of a week. And it's something he thinks about before he goes to sleep every night. So how are you going to choose one? <clears throat> no, I've got two. <laughs> well, one's, one's, one's a word and one's a letter. Go on. It's one and a half. Um, when, I, when I was a very, very small boy living in Portsmouth, there was a lovely, wealthy um, pair of female twins. Is it a pair of twins or just twins? Maybe a pair of twins. Twins, is four... I know. Being a twin, yeah, twins. Lovely. Actually, I thought they were old, but I was like eight years old. Maybe they were in their 30s at the time. Anyway. Or 12. A 1965 Morris Van der Plaat. And that Van der Plaat font, that beautiful script, yes. that metallic, almost written in a fountain pen in chrome on the back of the car, tiny little car. They're two of those giant Saluki dogs. Remember Salukis? Yeah. They're elegant sort of, you know, you're some sort of prince of Saudi Arabia if you've got a Saluki. They're two of these bloody things. You used to jam them in the back because those little Morris... I think it was a Morris Van der Plaat princess, but it was quite a small thing, 1100 engine, D-Reg. In like oh, a it was the 1100 that yeah. Gijaro or Bertone styled 1100, so, yeah, Van der Plaat. Yeah. But it's four-door, which actually you wouldn't think it was four-door because it's a tiny little car. Yeah, anyway, tiny. So for me, it was the Van der Plaat logo that I remember. I didn't even know, I think, frankly, don't know what it is now, but I didn't know what Van der Plaat was. It just felt so exotic and yeah. curious. And the other thing I'd say, and I bought a car just because of this one letter, the Z of Zagato, right? <laughs> Beautiful. Spot. That's a good, that's Absolutely. A good one. Absolutely. Makes the sign of the Z. Do you remember that on Saturday morning TV? Yeah. And, um, so the Z, I bought an Alpha SZ just really because of that little Z on the side. Actually, it's a better car. I, if I compare it to the Integrale, I'd take the Alpha every day because of the sound of the bloody engine. But really, it's all about that little Z on the front wing. Um, I can't disagree with either of those. Uh, uh, Edward Lovett, have you thought about this or have we surprised you with it? I have thought about it very briefly um, cool. at about 4.30 this morning. Yeah. Um, now, first of all, I've got there's, it's given me an idea. For all of those who are watching or listening, take your iPhone or whatever device you use and go and take a photo of your favourite typography and put it on Instagram and tag collecting cars and collecting addicts and with a hashtag and we'll choose our best one and we'll, sh we'll share a a reel of your choices during, yeah. uh, during the next right. week. Does that, so make, does that make us influencers? It was sort of, yes, yes. <laughs> I, think this is very, I think this is good. Yeah. No, um, good idea. So I've, I've I like got, this idea. I've got, two, I've got two from different eras. Well, actually, one of them's still there being used today. But the older one is the super legera sign on or the badge on the edge of a, an Aston Martin bonnet. Um, which you can see from a distance. It's very small. Most people don't go and read it, but you kind of know what it means. And it's just very cool. Um, you know, the British styling on, or the, sorry, the Italian styling on a, uh, on a British car. Um, and then the other one. Isn't it also a lie though, because a DB5 isn't lightweight at all. It's bloody it's heavy. Super light. Well, yeah, it's it is, sort yeah. of lighter, thinner steel gauge steel in the bodywork. That's what it meant, basically, wasn't it? Like me walking around with a T-shirt saying I'm funny. It's just not supportable. That's true. <laughs> yeah, that's that's more egregious, though. That is. By the way, Chris, I that's... don't use that word like. Chris, that, that's called self-deprecation. I'll teach you that one day. Okay, hey, but carry on. And then the other one, which we should try and do a T-shirt of this as well. Rally art. Ah, oh. and nice. I've yeah. still got mine. I've still got my my rally art jacket. <laughs> Yeah, that's a cool logo. Hey guys, can you remember the um, really Andrew Cowan? 
Dazenio Bertone, the B in the Bertone, yes. that beautiful yes. chevron. Yes. God, that was beautiful. Yeah. yeah. That's when I got my first Pro Drive jacket. I had to go and drive a Pro Drive. I think called a Pro Drive P1. Do you remember that? The mm. P1, the, two, the sort of two door one. And I thought, I, I reckon I'll blag this. So I, I went in. I wore my Rally Art jacket to Banbury, and they immediately went, "Get that off," and gave me a Pro Drive jacket. So I wore that instead. That's the way to get swag, boys. Wear the That's rival the brand, merch. And, they will, and they will absolutely rebrand you on the spot. When That's you... a, that, in all fairness, I, I know it's not a car, but the Pro Drive logo is a cool logo. It is cooler. a cool logo. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris Cooper, what, how do you feel about this? And, uh, and I know you, one of your badges will be the 640D. What's the other one? Not a D. When did swag become merch? Uh, about five years it's ago. Gus. It was about, about five years ago, anyway. Yeah. Um, actually, there are some current examples which I, I, I think aren't like what we've discussed. I think current BMW boot lid rear hatch to put is too big. Yeah. It's too big. Too big and gaudy. An X7, X40D, X yes. drive. Like, yes. No. Yeah. Also, can I, can I add one thing to that, Chris? That is that I do believe that when they make them smaller, like they do on the One Series, they're a bit fat. Some of the letters yes. are a bit fat. They're a bit, they're I mean, fat. things that are short yeah. and fat are offensive looking. They are, yeah. But I've always thought that. Anyway, <laughs> the ones that I think really work, because they kind of stick with you. There's a little badge that just says, and we could, I'll explain this in a second why I think it's okay to celebrate this. There's a little badge that appears at the bottom of the A pillar of arguably quite a groundbreaking car that just, it just, every time you see it, you just think that makes me feel warm and fuzzy and aspiration and so forth. It's the, on a Range Rover Classic, just below the bottom of the A pillar on the panel on the side of the car, where the panel gaps are about six weeks wide. Um, there's a little badge that says Range Rover, little sort of stainless steel yeah. sort of thing, just yeah. says Range Rover, where the R's are slightly bigger than the capitals and leather. It's just, I remember seeing that first thinking, gosh, what would it be like to have one of those or even ride in one of those? So that, you know, it's got nothing to do with our favorite car designer, mm -hmm. who will come back to us at some point later. But that Range Rover sign that just looks, I think they've probably meddled with it now, but the original Range Rover Classic looks really good. Um, current ones, which I think work really, really well. You know, you were asked to specify one. You're not allowed I one know. every decade that the car's been in existence. You know that, don't you? So that, because your, your question said car badges at the Mo, which I thought was meant to be contemporaneous. Alpina. I think Alpina typography it's nice. is really, really cool. You see Alpina on the back of a car, or on the, on the sort of the on the, the letters of the the mm. bottom of the splitter on the front spoiler, not picked out in silver, body yeah. color only. Anybody who's currently specking a car, car configurators, we've got to talk about it some. But I've got a bit of a bone to pick on car configurators, but an Alpina on the bottom of the splitter in yeah. body yeah. color, that's cool. I like that. I that just says well, everything well, about the car. Christmas. Chris, remind me, was your mother, was she a Alpina decal lady or was she a non-decal lady? No, she was non-decal, much to my annoyance. In fact, I bought one with, with decals on it and I took it home and, and she went, she went yeah. take it back and get rid of those stickers. Yeah, I'd have done yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, so I couldn't really argue with her. And I have to say that I agree with, and Chris Cooper will be hosting a special edition of this podcast on his own for Insomniacs worldwide on his issues with configurators. Um, as a sort of public service. Uh, now, moving on. Um, cars that you used to think looked good, but now don't. This was triggered by what actually was a shocking revelation of Chris Cooper on our group earlier this week, where he sent a photograph of one of what I would consider to be one of the great cars, and I'm sure you would as well, the E39 BMW estate, the Touring. Yeah. And he said... This car doesn't look very good anymore. The glass house is too big at the back. It's a bit bulbous. He used yeah. some really quite terrifying terminology. And anyhow, I hate to say it, I took it, I looked at the picture and thought, I think he might be right. Neil Clifford, tell us about things that you used to think looked good, why you think they don't look good now, and why you can still back your sense of the aesthetic. I spent an hour thinking about this this morning and couldn't really think of one. Because 
the as cars get older, I tend to like them more. And I've got such dislike of modern cars, particularly the dildo variety, that I think cars are like wine. I think they improve over time. So I'm gonna I'm gonna flip this. I flip this in my head, and said cars that I didn't like a long time ago, and now I like because I've become I, a free swim. There's no control. I've lost control of you all. That's what I usually do. I couldn't think of it one way, so I turned the telescope around and looked from the other end. <laughs> and when I and and we were talking about this abyss, me and my mates actually. And uh, with my young photographer, Instagrammy, clever friends that all drive around in better cars than me now. And as most of you know, because I've said it before, we, me and my mates have been going to Le Mans from, since 88. And we were, we were young and we had hair and we wanted to drive the fastest, newest thing. And then we saw all these old farts driving along in Bentley blowers. And we're like, what a bunch of wankers they are you why would you want to drive along in that stupid old slow piece of crap you know it's much better having a m3 sport evolution or a 993 turbo which i had for five minutes on a you know porsche bubble and now when i see those cars i'm like oh they're fantastic and it's because i'm now one of those old farts so maybe the young people look at me and say, what is he driving along in that lovely... I won't, I won't have that, Neil. Of course they don't. Citizen Bentley, you know, what the hell does that do for you? It's slow, it's crap, it's windy, it's cold, it's unreliable. It's none of those things, actually. Everyone should go and buy a Peterson Bentley. But I, I think I've turned it on its head. I used to dislike those old cars, and now I adore them, and I don't like the new cars. That's absolutely fair enough. What you've done there is with incredible agility, taken the question, turned it 180 and answered it beautifully. Chris Cooper, I can tell you you're itching here. You've got a list. You're allowed seven and no more than that. Here we go. I haven't got seven, but I think, because I, I I agree with you. I think there are lots of cars that you'd have thought, oh God, no, which now look great. But I do think there are, and I, I, it could be something to do because the other, the other, I hate to say this, and this came, this struck me, because right now, as of Wednesday evening, 11th of October, I think on collecting cars, there is an M635 for sale. Ooh. The M6, oh, as we God. called it. Yeah. Time. It was never an M6. It's an M635. CS I know, no, but everyone well. called it M6, didn't they? Well, they were, they were wrong. And they I were, know they were. They'll be punished. It had the same engine and, as the M5 and blah, blah, blah. It just doesn't quite work now. And it's because the glass house is just, it just looks slightly too big to me. And I have a feeling that there's a reason why the M5 does so much. There must be a reason why the M5, the E28 M5, does so much better than the E24 M635. Mm. The M635 was a motorsport car, same as the M5 was. But to, not, just, just, just hang on, I'm still going. No, no, no. Just going. To, let me summarise. I'm, I'm, I'm using my abilities here to summarise for the audience before you move on to your next, frankly, fucking absurd point. So you're telling me that the M635 CSI, that sharp-nosed piece of Hofmeister kinky brilliance, yep. doesn't look quite right, but you happily drive around in a Bangle-era 6-series convertible. Yes, I right. did. Next would I, point. Would oh, I now? Oh. Would I now? I'm, I'm offering you the floor. Over to you, Chris. So there's something about, there was something about that noughties, well, what do you think? When I said E39 Touring, the first time I'd ever, I'd ever thought about it, when I saw it on Sunday, there was, it was a lovely car. It was, somebody had... I had a brief chat with him. Somebody brought along an E39 M5 Touring. They clearly made it, hmm. but they had all the right bits and they'd done, you know, very, very expensive, labor of love, wonderful thing. And I thought, God, it's an M E39 M5, tick. It's a Touring, tick. I looked and I thought, I don't quite, quite like it as much as I thought I was going to like it. And I thought it's that rear bit of the glass house is just too big. The sort of the, the proportions of the size of the glass house to the side of the car 
just have aged just in slightly the wrong way. It's really irritating and frustrating. It just made me think, because I would have lusted after. I had a five, an E39 540. We can talk about cars that have got under our skin in, in a later episode. I had an E39 540 SE, mm. 80,000 miles in. I look at that now, I still think 17-inch multi-spoke wheels just look fantastic. And I thought even better would be a Touring. I've been looking for them think, do you know what? It doesn't work. E34 Touring does work. I, can't believe I, think, I, th I think they look a bit odd. I, I tell you what, I know nothing about design, but I've got some observations here on this. I agree, there are some cars that used to look great that, that have aged with less dignity. In an than odd way. And this is where the 911 comes in, all right? It's all, the answer to all these questions is always the 911. The two things that from day to car for me at the moment in the current era is, that is, is actually size of glass house to overall volume of metalwork. More fundamentally and generally speaking most modern cars have less glass to metal work than they used to. so when you see more glass your, your eyes go that's aged and the other things that have changed in terms of volume they take up on the space of a car are rear light clusters and front lights so when you see a car with big headlights and a lot of stuff going on at the front quite often that means age and it's, and the rear is even more so because now we have thin led strips and if you see big lights i give you the v the, the lovely v8 vantage that was launched you know middle of 2000s a great looking car but when you see one from behind it's the size of the rear light clusters that the yeah. aging they're called, that's a lot of lights and this is why the 911 is a bit of genius because it's always had a thin strip of rear lights so from generation to generation it doesn't look that much older a g series has got something about that high at the back so as a 964 so as a 993 it doesn't look much older and the front headlight tends to be about yay big doesn't get much smaller 911s tend not to age because i think those signature pieces of their identity haven't really altered in volume so i do think you do come across cars that when they've got a bit more like you look at the back of an e46 m3 just looks old compared to a, a current bmw because of the size of the rear light cluster yes. i've interrupted i've interrupted chris cooper carry on sorry no i i, I mean i you think you're spot on i think there are the glass house thing is the thing that gets me and it's a it's not all of them do it, but that's sort of that's one of the sort of the giveaways that made some of them. The 911 is a good one because 997, Gen 1 997, so there's something about the proportions of the rear deck. You know, I love convertibles. 997 cabs now just look horrific. Really second really gen ones look a bit better. Second gen ones look a bit better, but the first gen, slightly better. The first gen is a 911 that's got a big rear light cluster, and it looks old now because of yeah. those rear lights. I mean, the one, the 996 never looked. Now 996 Gen One never looked right. Oh, I and now I'm, well, looks, I've had too many good drives in those not to love them. But yeah, 997. Some of those 997 Gen Ones they haven't aged well. And Managed, the, the, what are your thoughts on on cars that you thought looked good, but now don't? So there's one car I really, really remember lusting after it when it came out. And um, I, it's the Ferrari 575. I just mm. think it's just lost. If you look at it, the back windows look a bit too triangular. The eyes look sort of too big. It's got that great big dam on the um, bonnet, which just, and the back doesn't look, oh, it's not a good looking car big overhang at the front reasonably big overhang at the back i just looks old doesn't look good has not i mean it's not it has not aged as well as my 456 m to be you think it's aged it's aged worse than the 550 yeah. i think so it's just got it, there's just something about it it's a bit bit you know the the haunches are a bit big it just it's a bit meaner looking and yeah i think the 550 looks more more elegant than the 575 yeah. and also the 575 and the 612 were contemporaries at the time we all thought the 575 looked great i think the 612 yeah. is a much better looking car now than totally. the 575 totally. I don't know if it looks yeah. better every day yeah and, and i'm not nine even more so say that again 599 even more so yeah, I always thought in, in in the period when five nine nine came out, I thought five fifty was better looking, but actually, in hindsight, five nine nine beats it. I think. Yeah, I mean, for looks, it's better looking. You think the five nine nine? Yeah, I agree. I completely agree. I actually think the five nine nine. You see the odd one on the road, and you know when they they come with that two tone, the dark, uh, the sort of black roof 
glassware section versus kind of either a, a red or a silver lower part. They, I think they look great. I think they look um, great. Oh, fine, Ed, would, Ed would love it. I, I'm with I'm with Neil, and I think it's very hard to really dislike any car. You, I can find ways of enjoying most of them. The 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 one design direction that I thought they were recovering, but I think they might have lost it again. Is the BMW Seven Series sort of where and and it started in the Bangle era, so that you know the last handsome Seven Series was the Golden Eye James Bond Seven Series shape, which I thought E thirty eight E thirty eight car that, that was a cool car. And then I, I re- at the time, I really, I, I quite liked the edgy bangle approach of the 7 Series. They clearly wanted to be different. They bought in iDrive, but some of the sort of the interior design, it was it was all quite edgy. And I, I started to warm to it. Mm. But I look at those today and that really is a dog's dinner. That, I like that them again. Of 7 Series. 7, 4, you like it, you? Yeah, Say that I've been again. Seven four five. Seven, Did you four, have five. one of those parked next to your six four five? That would be heaven for me. <laughs> I bet. It, I bet it would. <laughs> How many beers have you had? <laughs> Are they home brewed? One. That home brewed scrumpy cider you're actually on. Today? Actually, we need to talk about beer. <laughs> We're going to start brewing beer. Oh, oh, sorry, oh, and oh, sorry oh, just, just yeah. that. Just that. That seven series rant. They they did. It did improve a little bit in the last generation. And then seeing these i7s drive around London now, that, not- you know, that, that is an yeah. Eiffel. And I'm just not sure if it's doing the right Anything thing for me. Anything for yeah. Have you, seen, and, and, have you uh, seen the telly in the back seat? Have you seen the, the full well, yeah, that, telly that drops down from the ceiling? Oh, that looks wow. That looks cool. But I they, uh, do you think with the 7 Series, they've just decided that the S-Class is just got it right from a sort of beauty and proportion point of view, that there's no point even trying to compete on an elegant super well, saloon. Think, and, well, and all so they, think they need got it wrong. this highly radical thing. All they think they've got it wrong, and they're right. There was an i7. I, had, I stopped at Cullumpton Services on the M5 last Saturday. And for nostalgic reasons, I drove around, because I, I used to charge my electric car, going up and down the M5 to see the boys in the university. So for nostalgic reasons, I went round to the Ionity charging station just to see whether it was working, because it never used to work. And there was one of those new electric I7s in there. It was just vast. I mean, mm. just it is really vast. Cute, and yeah. the front looked like, it looked like Limousine by Jerry Anderson. It looked like Limousine in Thunderbirds rebooted, which I quite liked in some way, but I thought, God, you've got to be really confident to drive around in that, because people are just going to point and think, who, you, Chris Cooper, or, you, or you live in Beijing. You do it. You've got it in you to drive an i7 with the fucking teeth. <laughs> yeah, and I, I've driven six four five convertible for about they're six years. Upon, so they're everywhere those things. Right, I've got to stop this, are, yeah. this BMW shitbox conversation. I asked Neil Clifford a very specific question about cars that age and don't age. This is the age-old question: nine nine three or nine six four. What's the best looking? And at what point have, did you change your mind and fix your opinion? Because I vacillate on this hugely, but I've reached that final. Very good question. And this is mm. about age, because there's a point in which all of us preferred one to the other, and I'm not sure that's the case now. Where are you now? I was always nine nine three, and then I flipped back to nine six four. Who disagrees with that? No one. I think, it's, it's, I, I think hands, no, I, I, it's it's somewhat subjective, but I think we've got to base this on the standard nine eleven rather than going off yeah, into yeah, some yeah. special. Just variant. a Carrera two. Just a Carrera two. Carrera. Okay, so Carrera two. It probably does. There was a picture in a lot of the websites when um, it was at Bista. Neil, you and I were there on Sunday. Swindon uh, engines had announced, and they literally had on a stand, the cylinder head, their new Super Duper revs, the 12,000 revs cylinder yeah. head for air-cooled 911 engines, 964 and 993, literally on the table with some poor bloke waiting for someone to ask a question, what's that? And in their marketing thing, they had a little, little picture, and it was a 993 C2S taken from just, just off 
rear, rear three quarters with the front wheels turned outwards a bit. So you got a little bit more view of track at the front. I thought that looks bloody good. If it had been a nine, been a, a C2 on seven, because it's 18 inch wheels, C2 on 17 inch wheels, you'd have said, no, you made a mistake. You should have had a 964. That's so a fine tech. Nine, 964 is just so perfect, though, isn't it? It's it just in the standard so form. But 15, 15 years ago, I would have just, I would have eulogized about the 993. I'd have said the 94 looks too old. It looks like an old car. But I just, you change, don't you? Yeah, I mean, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. They're, it's like saying, what do you want, a Twix or a Crunchy? Do you know what I mean? They're both great. <laughs> <laughs> right, moving on uh, to our two-car garage, which I'm now Ooh. going to read out from my television, uh, whatever, telephone device. Th this so this was, was supplied, Chris, you, by one of our viewers and listeners. This was supplied by one of... I tell you what, Chris Cooper's bloody on it tonight. There's a reason why he's successful. Connery is on. his name. <laughs> yeah, Connery. <laughs> Honorary. Honorary. Yeah. I have Honorary. to say, like they've been bloody good. I mean, the comments on YouTube, and there's some brilliant ones. We've got, we're going to have we... to do this for a long time to get through all of those. We'll do most of them about will, you Chris being will, best. Chris. Chris will, Chris will finish his um, Insomniac's episode about his uh, issues with uh, car configurators by doing 21 of his own two car garages through the night next week <laughs> i dare you to say you're not frustrated by the modern day inter manifestation Twin of car, power, two car garage I'm not, not I'm not i'm not in the market for a new car so here we go right this just this was forwarded to me by me and it begins this is great <laughs> don't know why i wrote that probably because it is two car garage you've been hired as the creative director for the new james bond film that that's Fictional, by the way. None of us has been, but you're just imagining that. Speak for yourself. You have, yeah. you have to choose two new cars for 007 from any brand of your choosing. To, uh, yeah, repetition of the word choose. One has to be a newer car to advertise a new product, and the other is to be something vintage pre-80s. You've been allocated a budget of £400,000 for both cars. I'll now hand this over to the floor, not in any way covering for the fact that I totally fucking forgot to answer the question myself. Manish, cover for me. Oh, um, my actual official job title is creative director of Jeeva Maya Films. So, um, Don't mess this up then. No, no, I, I enjoyed this because it's a, Mr. Cooper and I had a little quick chat about this before. Even is it cheating. supposed to be the same brand? Because I assumed it is supposed to be the same badge. And you're supposed to find a modern version of this badge, an old version of this badge. But Mr. Cooper's interpretation was that, to, no, pick an iconic Bond car from now and pick an iconic Bond car from them. So an adjudication, please. It's up to you. You're creative director. You, no, you do what you want. This is the last well. time, by the way, Manish, you're going to have any time to prepare because next week we are going back to the original idea. of. I'm going um, to pass this over to the father figure amongst us. Neil Clifford, you decide what Manish can do now. Um, the same mark. I think so. Thank you, Mr oh, Clifford. So oh. I, thought, I, I thought a couple of things. It has to be the same mark and that means they still, it has to be a, an English car that was made then that, you know, the mark still exists. And I'd say, I'm a little bit in love with a Lotus Amira. Mm. And I thought Bond would look quite cool in a Lotus Amira. And I got onto the configurator. <laughs> we should do a session on configurators. So I really- a good idea. Myself. Huh? I think we should do it. I really think we should do it. So they've got a very beautiful blue, Meridian blue. Mm -hmm. Which I thought was just a very cool bond. I could see that. You know, he drives through Monaco, does the whole south of France thing, has a big chase, comes out of it. Oh, hold on, let me just get so, so so Bond's in Monaco and he's just up against he's gone to the casino and he's talking to an absolute rocket blonde and he goes, Yeah, it's got a Toyota engine in it. Uh, he would how does, know. She, how does she, that work? It's four hundred horsepower. It's a beautiful okay, car and it, oh, it's, it's, cool. it's it's so gorgeous this car so he's going to get a load of Samira and yep. um I'm sure Q will put some very clever little gadgets in it perhaps the like a proper engine a dildo I, you know he's going to just press a button and something will happen right. um, and then and this was 85,000 pounds I mean there's so much money left over for a decent sort of um second car 
I discovered somebody called Matt Oxley today. And oh, Matt, he's a great journalist. Bike, oh my God. But he, and he just literally, there's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful Lotus Esprit S1 restoration, yeah. which is in Colorado orange. And I'm going to, I don't normally hold pictures up, but I thought this was stunning. It's just, it, it is just, such, look at this, look at this. He's had months to prepare for this. Dear. Oh, my dear God. That no, is quite no. nice. Wait, that's going to get some interior, bug, get some bug roll. No, get this. The, the interior of this car is is green and tan. Yeah, the, the tartan, yeah. Can you show me that photo again? Oh, God. <laughs> This is so gorgeous. Look, 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 look. Hold on. Neil, did you didn't you have did you have one of those with the green and um the tartan no. inside? No. No, you no. I, I, I thought I, I think Neil um Hairpin had one and then it ended up with Matthew, I think. That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Christopher. All right, calm okay. down. Okay. And a lotus is free. And, and, and look, just look at this interior. Look at this interior. This is so gorgeous. I I I didn't know people did this. That is just... Yeah, that's the yeah, one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the no, And it went, it was auctioned for £67,000. And I think someone took a feather duster to every component in the engine. But it's, it's just, it was gleaming. It's beautiful. I can see Bond in both right. of them. I, I, think it's a, I think that's really good. It's British. Also, but there's a Lotus connection. I'm moving us on. Manish, that's going to be hard to beat. Neil Clifford, where are you? Look, you guys are all dicking around. The only car that Bond can drive is an Aston Martin. Okay. It's the only, you know, it's the point of Aston Martin's existence. And if you're, a, if you're, a, if you go and buy an Aston Martin, the only thing that's on your mind is, am I going to look like James Bond? So you, you, uh, in my view, you have a DB12. I think it's a, it's a, uh, it's a brilliant looking car. It's three hundred. They, they've done a, they've done a good job with that. Yeah. Fantastic job. The interior now is as good as the outside. Most Astons are quite pretty, frankly, but some of them are sort of shit when you drive them. But the DB12 looks fantastic. All the reviews say it drives fantastic. They've invented this new class almost of whatever it is, the GT supercar. The interior is bloody gorgeous. The Much leather, better than recent. The colors recent another time. thing Audi should learn from. Maybe do some nice colors. Oh. As opposed to just black and grey, lots of people could learn from that. And lots of yeah. people. That's a subject that Porsche. Neil, do you know? Do you know who would completely agree with you on that? Cars. Luca Montezemolo says that is the most beautiful Aston Martin in modern time. He says that is a work of absolute art. So I've spent three the man, and I've bought a DB12. So I've got 70 grand left. And you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm referring to my brother. My brother owns a garage in Portsmouth, Trevor. Bless my mother. She gave us all very 70s names, even though he was probably born in the 50s because he's like 70 years old. Um, he's been restoring a Virage. Oh, a Virage. Which oh, a, put... a 90s Virage, not the one that they... Yeah, yeah, the Ken Greenlee one. Early Virage. I think it's on a 1991... Yeah. And it's in valiant blue. So most gorgeous blue. A very rare colour, because most of them were sort of British racing green and there were, you know, a few red ones, weren't they? But most of them British racing green or navy blue. It's a very light, beautiful um, light blue called valiant blue with red leather, light blue with red leather. And it's actually, he's done everything. He's done the bodywork, he's done the engine, he's done the suspension, it's perfect it's totally mint condition this thing and i would match my db12 to my brother trevor's virage and i'd have like 20 grand left for servicing so be more trevor that's what we need to know that's a fantastic car and i want to you, know, you can buy it in 118th scale in valiant blue with red leather interior yeah. and i may have to buy the model yeah it's a, it's a gorgeous. It's a question. Neil Clever, here's a question for you. A bit of trivia. Where did the rear light cluster come from for the Virage? Um, Vauxhall? No. Or Granada. Oh, Sirocco. Facelifted, facelifted Sirocco. 
Morocco. Really? Yeah. yeah. Based in um, Morocco. Um, Edward Lovett. The, the, what, a little, this is a thing that people not know about Edward Lovett. There's a little bit of trivia that actually, in his own mind, he thinks he's James Bond. So this is going to, it's going to be incredible to see how he answers this. Also really, biographical. He's just looking in the mirror. Go on, Edward. Well, thank you for that, Christopher. And uh, you're not wrong. However, today, Michael, I am the creative director of James Bond. So uh, Neil, Neil's wrong. Manish is wrong. And uh, as the creative director, I can do whatever I fucking want. So, exactly. um, yeah. So Mr. Bond is having, and you did say a new car. So Neil, I do like the, the, the DB12 idea, but I don't think they've launched the DB12 Volante yet, have they? And obviously oh. we need to, it, these are our two car garages. So one has to have a, uh, com, one has to be convertible. Those are the rules. So a 296 GTS is going to be my modern car. Yeah. Um, and is that an Aston Martin? Uh, it could be, yeah. Uh, it just puts sort of super legera badges on the front bonnet, okay. and it could uh, it could yeah. be disguised as a as an Aston Martin. Carry so on. I think two nine six GTS. I think as a modern Bond car, hybrid, um, V six convertible. I think I think that's a good choice. And then my car from the eighties. Now most two car garages have to contain. A Porsche, obviously, that should really be the other rule or a 10 car garage or something like that. And now, yes, I am Bond and I still do like a tailored suit, but you know, most of the time I do like to wear a collecting cars t shirt and shorts. That's really what I wear. So I've decided instead of me wearing a pinstripe, I'm going to put the pinstripe into the car. So, you know, one of the best seats with a pinstripe is a 3.2 Carrera Club yeah, Sport. Two, so yeah. That's going to be my tailored pinstripe suit. Um, and that is going to be my two-car garage. Yeah. Okay. The bad ones will never get me. And this is this is like, this is James Bond, not James Bondetti, or James yeah. Bond it's, Bond. It's, yes, I'm he's, the creative he's, director. He's James Bond Bond one day, then he's James Bondetti the next day. Okay, <laughs> yeah. I like it, I like it. <laughs> He's 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 a pan. I'm gonna have my I'm gonna have my secret lair. I'm gonna have I'm gonna have my secret lair in uh, in Swindon. What's amazing is we're watching the. It was dark when we started as Edward, and it's light now. I've not. Yeah, seen what's that, that bridge? Yeah, that yeah. That, the, well, I haven't got a particularly good room to be honest with you, but this Sydney Bridge is just here. But what a fucking beautiful city this is. Look, that the, is. You yeah. can't quite see them, but the yeah. yachts in the harbour here, and there's the, that small little. Island just over there somewhere, I, and the I yacht, could show the you Hemel were, Hempstead through that window there if anyone's interested. The yachts were racing around there uh, yesterday. Uh, Eighteen after foot the... Sydney Harbour skiffs, yeah. Simon Brilliant. Nern lives there, monkey. Does he? He's a big, big time sailor in those 18, 18 foot Sydney Harbour skiffs. They're like, it's like supercars on water. It's just gone. They've gone completely bonkers. Um, I know nothing about boats. This is Chose, it's proved by my choice of boat. Uh, right, Chris Cooper, uh, who are you? Who are you going to go with in terms of brand, and what model is you going to go for? So I've written down Hawker Tempest. The okay. reason I wrote down Hawker Tempest today, the internet told me, so it must be true. A Hawker Tempest flew for the first time in fifty years. It's been rebuilt at Seawall, Seawall, going yeah. to um, Duxford. I thought okay. it was brilliant, beautiful thing. Yep. Anyway, yep. so. Um, so this is a new James Bond film. It's a new James Bond. It's a new direction. So it depends what kind of Bond it's going to be. But I think there's some givens. I think there's some givens. Um, it's got to be British. It's got to be British. And I think it's got to be a bit of a, a bit of a look to the past and a bit of a look to the future. But I think the look to the future has got to have something nostalgic and in the past in it as well. And because I am the creative director, I can wave a magic wand because it's a Bond film and Bond films can make any fantasy reality. No one's ever said this to you before, Chris, but your foreplay is going on too long. Okay. <laughs> the first car, the old one, it's got to be Lotus Esprit Turbo. Yes. Ooh. From For Your Eyes Only. 
not the white one, the copper Forever. fire one. That Forever. sort of bronzy colour. It's called copper you fire. Got, you going with skis on the roof or not? Yeah. It's yeah. Fire, hasn't it? It's got to have skis yeah. on the roof. So a copper fire, the one that doesn't blow up when it says it's got a burglar alarm and he pulls the door and the thing blows up. So the one that was filmed in Cortina, um, that you have that one. Um, the new car, the new mm. car. I see most of us have just ignored the fact that they've got to come from the same manufacturer, as have I. Because, <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't think of this, Neil. I think the new car in my fantasy world, would be a new Bristol. No. Oh. A new Bristol. Mm. Because it's just got that unbelievable, wonderful British sort of heritage <laughs> as well. as I always felt there's something slightly contemporary about it, even in the old stuff. I'm going to put you Classic. on the spot. Given this is a company that has given us the fighter, the brigand, and gone as well, else, what would you call it? I kind of think I like Tempest. That's kind of why one of the reasons I wrote that down. Nice. I know it's not a Bristol thing. Um, Brabazon, it's not a Bristol Brabazon. That's too big. Everyone know Brabazon is? I saw that again yes, today. That's as well. the massive airplane, isn't it? That was the size the of massive it. airplane that flew once, and that was it. No. Oh, yeah. I suggest the name. How about how about the Bristol Melchit? <laughs> the bazooka, yeah. also known as the Cardinal. Yes, the Bristol Hairnet. Bristol moustached, moustachioed hairnet. So I think you'd have a modern day Bristol. No, okay. I, I think that. I think that's going to be a, powered a, by. Uh, it's going to be a Siamese. It's going to be two Siamese Chrysler V tens put together, making the world's first V twenty. W twenty. That, 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 that would be interlocked. These are end to end. Yeah. Oh right. Oh well, like that. Yes. You okay. see. Yes. You see. And the bonnet would be thirty eight feet long. Yeah, and the and the and the mascot would be Neil Clifford leaning into the wind like that. Uh, <laughs> It'd be like right, that bloke who put uh, the Berlin engine in that thing that was we all dared us to buy recently. But yeah, yeah. So th I, th I think you've all done well, but you've sadly you've proved why none of you should be creative director of anything. So oh. I'm the creative director. My story begins somewhere in the French Riviera, where my life has become complicated. Um, I'm up to my nuts in prostitutes. Um, all sorts of substances I shouldn't be, wine, people I shouldn't be around. Uh, and there's a boat that I can't afford to run. So I'm in the shit and I need some money. So I start doing deals with car companies because I think I can get a brand deal on board for James Bond. And I tell everyone else at Eon Productions that I'm wooing Ferrari and Aston Martin. But in reality, I've gone to China because they've got a fuck ton of money and they want to be in Bond. So I've gone, to, I've gone to a company that used to be British that's doing rather well right now. And I've said to them, you need James Bond driving an MG. And they've gone, we're fucking in for it. And I've said, I'll get you into the Bond franchise if you give me 50 million quid personally. But I'll keep it a secret. We'll do a big unveiling. So Eon go down to the Riviera. And there I unveil their two cars for the Bond franchise. It's already signed up. The paperwork's done and dusted. I'm thinking the boat's paid for. I'm scot-free. I'm drinking nothing but protein shakes the rest of my fucking life. And I unveil an MG RV8 because it's got that retro look. It's a V8. Bond's going to look spectacular in it. And he can also talk at length about the ladder chassis and how ultimately it's quite a reliable form of transport. And he's going to have an MG4 EV to show oh. his eco credentials. But he's going to have a back seat that falls down so he can splice birds. And then it's absolutely, he's a bang on, he's sorted out. There's nothing can go, it could be men. I don't, I don't really mind what he's doing in it. But ultimately, MGRV8, MG4 EV, 50, 50 million quid in the bank. And I'm, 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 I'm walking on sunshine to quote a famous pop song. Uh, can you argue against that, any of you? No. No, no, you win. Where would you <laughs> start? Right. You know, MG. MG right now in the UK is selling twice as many cars as Renault so far. It's amazing. And, and do you know what? They're, they're, I had a go on one. Th there's no argument. If we're, if we're being reduced to buying white goods, why not buy one of those? It's bloody yeah. cheap. It goes well. It looks good. Why would you buy an ID whatever if you can have one of those? Isn't it because they're selling them for 20 grand below cost? Probably. Yeah. Well, they've yeah. got big advantages, haven't they, in the supply chain and batteries and stuff and I know. I'm not sure it's good. I'm not sure it's good. Any of that. Appreciation for 
before they've even come out of the factory. For the consumer. Um, yeah. Fair now, enough. Yeah. I'm going to bring this to a close by saying we should, I've, I've chosen a song because I'm in Italy and I've always wanted to tell people about this song. I'm sure one of you will know about it, probably Manish. So in 1972, because I'm in Italy, an Italian singer called Adriano Celentano, Celentano wanted to demonstrate that if you made a song that sounded like it was sung in English, it would go straight to the top of the charts. And you might be aware of this song. It is a song that is entirely gibberish. It has no meaning to it at all. It's a series of sounds that sound like him singing in English. You have to Google it because the name of the song is about 17 letters long and it makes no sense at all. But it's a gibberish song that went to number one to prove that Italian people in 1972 would rather listen to English sounding songs. It's so brilliant and the video is so brilliant. I insist that you go and Google it right now. That's my music for the week. <laughs> Who would you like to go? Uh, Neil, I'll, I'll see you, please. Oh, sorry, darling. Um, there are millions of wonderful songs, millions and millions and millions, and then there are a few incredibly special songs, isn't there? There's like one or two per decade. Bohemian Rhapsody, um, Elton John, Frankie Goes to Hollywood. And I was listening randomly to my little songs podcast. No, not a podcast. Um, Spotify list thing. It's got like 4,000 songs in it. and Ian Jury and the Blockheads came up, hit me with... With your rhythm oh. stick. And actually, you know, it's old. My kids don't get it. What's that crap you're listening to, Dad? It is such an incredibly talented song. The words, the music, the rhythm, the people, the Top of the Pops video, this incredible character. It's just wonderful. So that's... There's a real theme to your... Uh podcast this week neil i feel <laughs> yes it's very good very good man <laughs> but also how how can you make the phrase ich liebe dich sound so fucking good yeah. with an estuary <laughs> accent it's just amazing listen uh, to the uh, bass listen to the bass on that song is that's amazing um okay manish over to you very very unpleasant weekend as we all know so uh, my song is Cat Stevens' Peace Train. Okay. Yeah. That's a good choice. A very good choice. Um, uh, Chris Cooper. So, I don't know, we've already had this. We must have done, but I just can't find it on the list. I'm thinking about James Bond and Aston Martins. And I saw over the weekend, I just flicked on and there on the television was No Time to Die. And that last scene when she's driving with Matilda and Louis Armstrong, we have all the time in the world is playing. Wow, that is a good bit of film, that is. That's just really nice. And that's just, it is just a driving, lovely song. So, yeah. So, Louis Armstrong, we have all the time in the world. Mm. Edward, are you still with us or are you, or are you awake? I, you I, haven't got any, I haven't got any Fred again again. I need, I need to... I need to have a shower and go and eat some eggs and pork product downstairs. Well, Edward, a, a sterling effort from my from our fellow well done. Edward Lover, who started this at about 4.20 a.m., to Manish Pandey, who uh, who once again smashed it on the two-car garage, to Chris Cooper, who I gave far too shit, too much shit to during this podcast, which I apologise, because I love him dearly, but I've had about six pints, uh, and to Neil Clifford, who once again made us all look a bit average. Uh, thank you so much for coming along. Uh, Manish has got one more thing to say. It's an important piece of news from this week. Yes, uh, Formula One news, Max Verstappen, three times world champion. And there we go. That That's the news the of this week's podcast. Go and look up that Italian song I told you about. It's absolute madness. See you next week. Bye. No Audis, no Audis were hurt in the making of this podcast. <laughs>